Cup so deep. I couldn't do it. <laughs> Just give me a second. <sighs> Luke chapter 7. Ah. I'm going to read from verse 36 to 50 and then pray. Ah. <clears throat> Sweet Jesus. Uh, then one of the Pharisees, in verse 36, then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner. When she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him. For she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, Teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, which is about a year and a half wages, and the other 50, which is about a month of wages. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman who anointed my feet with fragrant oil, therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the anointing of the Holy Ghost and the gift grace that rests upon this place. May this words be lifted up upon the hearts of the people. Keep me covered, Father God. Keep me covered. May I be cloaked in your anointing and in your power of your spirit to bring forth this message to these people. May their ears be ears to hear and hearts to receive and minds to understand. Only you can do the work that I sense in the spirit realm. And I sense it deeply. So I ask you, Father God, for your gift, grace, and your mercy to come upon this place in a very, very special way. This day, this day I pray in Jesus' name. And the house of God says, Saints, this particular 
passage is not Mary and Martha at Lazarus' house. That's a different passage altogether. And there is another place in the Bible where it talks about Mary, and she also anoints him. But it also is very clear that she anointed him for his burial. And that was at Lazarus' house in Bethany, and the scriptures declare that. And, of course, that shows in another gospel where Judas is upset and said, this should have been sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor. And Jesus said, but she has done a good thing to me and, and that the poor you will have with you always. And the scriptures bear out that Judas only said that because he wanted to get his hands on the money that he was a thief. The scriptures declare that. So this particular passage stands alone because, see, Mary the one that is the sister to Martha related to Lazarus, both of them, she was a godly woman. She wasn't known as this in the city as this sinner woman that everybody in the city seemed to know that this was a sinner woman. So we have to let this scripture in Luke stand alone for what it has to say. And this Pharisee's house, and some of the Pharisee is Simon. And where my heart breaks in this area is, uh, is, the, is the story of the debtors. It really is. It's the story of the debtors. We look at this woman, and we see the, her sacrifice. Of, she learned where Jesus was. He was at the Pharisee's house. And he's at the Pharisee's house. We have to picture this. The Pharisee asks him to come. So the Pharisee, Simon, he's, he's a, a, a teacher. He's a rabbi. He's a person who's going to have a spiritual, religious dialogue, if you will, with Jesus. He has a banquet. He has a feast at his house. He invites Jesus in. But you've got to remember something that you don't really think about when you hear these particular stories. Uh, you have to remember that most of the Pharisees really didn't have nothing to do with Jesus. Didn't care much for him, did they? They was usually angry at him and upset with him. So when we look at the story, we need to look at the Pharisee, first of all, his actions and his attitudes before we look at the woman. The Pharisee, Simon, when Jesus entered in, it was customary that you would give them water to wash their feet. That would have been customary. That would be the custom. So if the Pharisee was going to honor Jesus and honor who he was and respected him, he would have done at least the customary thing of providing water to have his feet washed before entering into the house. That's customary. But he did not do that. So you see, we don't look at it through the Pharisee's eyes of what Jesus is seeing. And I think someone's going to try to come through the front door. I'm not sure. I just seen somebody go past the window. Um, that the Pharisee, the Pharisee if you, it, he actually has uh, disdain, if you will. He's Actually, it looks to me like the Pharisee is doing a public shame. He's being disrespectful. He invites Jesus, but he's not respecting the opportunity to wash his feet or to have someone of the servants in the house, somebody to wash his feet. So first of all, he enters in, having Jesus entered in, and he shames him right on the spot. Disrespect and shame. Then we find out that he also says, you didn't greet me with a kiss. And that they do. They still do it to this day. And so the Bible says, greet your brother with a holy kiss. And what they do is it's just a kiss on the cheek. It's they, that's a greeting. Rabbi Zadok, when I meet with him and stuff, and we meet at the airport or something like that, it's the same thing. It's, it's, it's just it's, uh, it's respect. It's, it's honoring somebody that you care about. You wouldn't do that to just a complete stranger. It's somebody you respect. Well, the Pharisee must not have respected him any because he didn't even get greeted with a holy kiss. Didn't get no water to wash his feet. Didn't get no holy kiss. And he didn't get the other thing. The third thing is that many times it's customary to anoint them when they came into your house out of who you're respecting. I mean, this is a Jesus. This is a rabbi. This is a teacher that multitudes and thousands of people are coming to listen to. And he's already healed some. He's already raised the dead. He's done great miracles, but he don't give them a little bit of anointing oil. So he talks about the debtors and about how one of them has got the debt, and that debt there is, is like I said, is a year and a half's wages, and the other one is only a month's wages. And he asked them which one, which one would love the more, 
the one that was forgiven the most. So we see now when the woman comes in and we see the Pharisee, again, he's saying within himself. It didn't say he said it out loud. He said within himself. Again, this religious leader is judging and condemning Jesus, allowing these actions to take place. The Pharisee, Simon, says, if he were a prophet, do you see the disdain that must have been in there? If he were, he's saying it within himself, judging and criticizing Jesus. If he were a prophet, he would know what sort of woman this is and that she is a sinner. And he is allowing her to touch him. Jesus, he already knows because the scriptures bear it out. He knows what's in the intent of the heart of man. So he knows what the man is thinking. And that's the reason he turns to him and says, Simon, and gives the story of the dead. Now let's talk about this woman. I don't know the details of what her past sinning was. I don't know the details. There's speculation, and I understand where they get some of their speculation. I'm just reading the text for what the text has to say. Because if I was going to go into speculation, I would almost could speculate something that nobody else speculates, and not about her sin, but speculate that the fact is, is that she knew that Jesus was being publicly shamed at that, fair, at that Pharisee's house. What, what if? We, see, we never thought about that. We always wanted to put her into the, uh, maybe the, because of the custom area of letting her hair down, that she was a, a local harlot, a prostitute in that city, and everybody knew that she was a prostitute and she was a sinner. I get this, you know, the reason why maybe they think that at the time, but that's not the point. The point of the matter is that we focus so much on her that we don't judge ourselves as the Pharisees. You see, sometimes we need to flip the script for just a few moments and say, wait a minute, I've never put myself where I have to judge my own heart. I'm a religious person. I'm not committing a lot of sins. And therefore, I'm judging and criticizing the others who are big chief sinners in the city. And uh, these people that are really big sinners ought not be with Jesus, not realizing that Jesus is accepting to forgive their sins. And we know that the verse ends that she was saved by her faith, her faith, her faith. That's what it says in verse 50. The one, he said to the woman, your faith saved you. Go in peace. He didn't say the way you just came in and you washed my feet with your tears and that you anointed my feet with oil and that you continued to kiss my feet. He said your, your actions and your works is not what just gave you salvation, but it was your faith. And when you flip the script on her to see what's going on, you got a woman that's going into a religious leader's house, a Pharisee. And customarily, if he's inviting Jesus to come to a little banquet at his house, that table would have been filled with mainly men discussing different kind of religious point of views. So it would have been a religious meeting, not just a buffet. So when she was bold enough, and this is what we've got to get in these last days, We've got to have not just women's heart, but men's heart that are bold enough to say, okay, everybody in town knows that I'm a sinner. All right, everybody is looking down their nose at me, all the religious people, and the religious leaders see me as an outcast, see me as worthless. But you know what? I'm not going for their applause. I'm not going for their opinion. I learned that Jesus is in that house, and I'm going to go to that house and I'm going to do what the religious leader wasn't willing to do. 
He did not honor him by having his feet washed. He did not honor him with a holy kiss on the cheek. He did not honor him with oil. I'm going to go on in there, and I'm going to put to shame that religious leader, that Pharisee that thinks he's more closer to God, more closer to the things of God than me, the wicked woman in the city. I'm going to show him what worship looks like. I'm going to show him that those that has forgiven much love much. So that whole scenario shows that the people that we would see in this world as some of the greatest outcasts, some of the most hopeless, some of the people that we think will never shine, they'll never rise up out of the ashes, they'll never rise up out of the mud, they'll never have their lives changed. This is a story of hope that you can have radical change when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. When you put your faith in Jesus, not in what you've done in the past, but you put your faith in the Lord and the Savior, Jesus Christ. And she was willing to go past the religious people. Saints, I got to tell you something. God loves the sinner but hates the sin. God loves the sinner but hates the sin. He does not have any fear in touching a person with leprosy because it does not make him unclean. It makes the leprosy clean. You see what I'm saying? He don't have a problem with touching a dead person because he can raise them from the dead. But the religious people had so much religion going on, looking down their nose at everybody else. Half the time you got Jesus rebuking the Pharisees, the religious leaders, and he's out there with the sinners, out there with the people that they would cast aside. He come to seek and save that which is lost. And I'm telling you, when you look, and that's why I just said it was kind of hard for me to even open up this message and tears was flowing down my eyes because only, only, only you and I know our own sins. And we look at our own lives. No, no, we, we don't want to compare it to other people. We don't want to compare. It. That's what the Pharisee was doing. He likes to compare it because it makes him feel better about himself. See, he thinks he's, he's more righteous than Jesus because Jesus is allowing this woman to touch him. You see? Don't be religious. Look at your own heart. Look at your own heart. And then when you see your own heart and you see that Jesus is your Savior and you see that he is your Messiah, he's the one. That he's the one. For us, we know he's the one that died for us, shed his blood for us, was raised from the dead for us. When you see that he paid that price that we can do today, that he paid the price and the sacrifice that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We don't have to push through the crowd to get to the house. We don't have to bring the oil. We don't have to bring the water. We don't have to bring all that. Well, all we got to do is bring our heart to him and say, Jesus, you know what a wicked sinner I have been. The chiefest of sinners, as the apostle Paul said, you know that my sins, though they be many, with your blood washing me and forgiving me of all of my sins and all of my transgressions, through you, I love you even the more. Because you didn't only forgive the little things that I've done, but you forgive the things that I've done over and over again because apparently she was continually practicing whatever her sin was. I don't know what it was. She could have been the town drunk as far as I know. It, I don't care about that. I, 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 what I want to get over to your heart is even though she was practicing as a practicing sinner, a practicing sinner, and everybody began to know about her and the noise of her, her sins went all throughout the city and people recognized her. And to the point the Pharisees are saying, Jesus, if you're a prophet, this is what he's saying to himself, you ought to know what kind of woman this is. You ought to know who she is. Everybody else in town knows. You ought to know who she is. Saints, how many people are we going to throw out the church in these last days before we allow God to change their heart? Because when they come in messed up, tore up from the floor up, and we want to look down our nose at them because we've been in church for 10 years. We've been in a church for five years. They haven't been in the church for two weeks. You got to know how to let a heart beat and let the gospel come to them and let the good news be preached to them. They may take a little time before enough seed of God's word gets into their cold, calloused heart before they realize, I need a savior. I need a deliverer. I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I need the peace of God. 
I know I deserved hell for all the stuff that I did. But he went to hell to pay a price so I didn't have to go there. And I want Jesus Christ in my heart. I want Jesus Christ in my mind. I want Jesus Christ in my house and my home. I want to live for him. He died for me. I want to live for him. He paid a price that I could not pay. He did. He paid a debt that I owed that I could have never repaid. You have debts that you could not afford to pay, to repay to God. So God made a ransom out of his own son to purchase you up out of your sins and transgressions. When you see the tenacity of this woman willing to go into that house, knowing the whole house was full of hypocrites. Come on, you know I'm talking about the church body and not Lisbon. You know I'm not talking about the Lisbon church, but I am talking about church. Get to church and a bunch of hypocrites. Bunch of hypocrisy and hypocrites looking down their nose at one another, checking out who's the biggest sinner in the room. Let me tell you, you don't have to look any further. Look to the one who loves him the most, and you'll know who did the most sinning. Look who's willing to lay down their life and be a living sacrifice to him. Look who's willing to be a drink offering poured out. Look who's willing to turn the cheek when they've been slapped many times. Look at the one who's willing to pray for their enemies and not curse their enemies. Look for the one that's willing to forgive those who wounded them and hurt them and spoke ill of them and in contrast and always destroy them, wagging their tongue, murmuring and gossiping and causing all kinds of perverted thoughts in other people's minds to destroy another person in the church. Those are the hypocrites. It's the one that comes to the altar crying, My God, my God, though my sins be many, though my sins be many, and many known in the city, and many never to be known in the public. But through you, Jesus, Through you, Jesus, I can be saved if I put my faith and my trust in you, not in the Pharisee, not in the religious leader. See, this is a mistake. Years ago, trying not to give too much detail. This is years years ago. A pastor a very large ministry well something happened it wasn't sexual immorality but something happened and he ended up in a divorce A woman came into the church, had been visiting for quite a while, and she was all in tears. Total meltdown because this pastor and his wife were getting a divorce. And saying, how, how sad. Not that they, because they were getting a divorce, But why is her faith wrecked over someone else? That's why you can't put your faith in Simon the Pharisee. Your your faith can't be in man. She was no longer even attending that church. She wasn't a part of that church, that ministry for a long time. I've seen it, where people have been placed on big pedestals. Their ministries are extremely large and known worldwide. But they're just men. They're just women. They're just humans. They make mistakes. 
Some of them, in this case, wasn't uh, their choice. It was their spouse's choice. The pastor didn't want it, but his wife did. I've seen it happen more than once, not just big ministries. We must keep our faith in Jesus alone. Ministers will come and go. Powerful, anointed men and women of God. They will come and they will go. But when you realize that maybe you got saved under their ministry, but it was God who brought the salvation to you. And maybe you gave your heart when you heard the gospel preached and you got convicted by the Holy Ghost and you were underneath that woman's ministry or that men's ministry. I'm sure many under Catherine Kuhlman got saved. I'm sure there was many that got uh, saved during Azusa Street revival. I mean, multiple people. To me, I heard the good news. I heard the gospel and I knew I needed him. I knew I needed him, but I also wanted him. I wanted Jesus. I wanted him in my heart. I, I even remember as a child in the church of the Nazarene, and in the church of the Nazarene, they would sing the old rugged cross. And there was a cross up there behind the podium, up on the wall. And as they would sing the old rugged cross out of the greenback hymnal, it's in the red back too, but it was green in the, in the church of the Nazarene. I would cry, even as a child. I would cry, oh Jesus, oh Jesus, you're so precious, you're so precious. You would give your life for me, and you did. You took the whippings, you took the beatings, you took the cursings, you took the blows, you took the crown of thorns. You did everything for me. You see, it became personal. And that's what salvation is, saints. Salvation is a personal experience. You can't shove it on nobody. You can't shove it down the throat. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. No matter how hard you want all your family to be saved, it's a personal experience. And when you have that personal relationship with Jesus, every day is a brand new day. Every day you wake up and you're thanking him. And you know that one day you'll see him face to face. One day, one day, one day, one glorious day. You'll see him face to face. You'll be able to look right into his eyes and his eyes piercing through you with such love you've never experienced on this earth with such passion and compassion and love as he allowed this woman to do what she did. Can you imagine you're going to be able to hug him and hold on to him and actually embrace him and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. All eternity, I will worship you and I will thank you. Throughout the endless of ages, I will glorify you. There will only be one time in heaven where there will be silence. It's in the scriptures of Revelation. Right now the angels are singing. The creatures are saying, holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. All of heaven is alive, rejoicing in sound and worship and songs and music. So much is going on in the heavens. But there'll be a time of total silence and nothing but the love, the vibrating power of the love of God and his glory, his glory that fills the temple. Such a holy hush will come over the angels, a holy hush over the saints. Not even the horses of heaven will make a sound, not a hoof will move. We will stand in awe. We will stand in awe and then probably fall prostrate to the ground at the feet of Jesus, the Messiah, 
And if we have a crown of righteousness, we'll toss it to the side. For we will have no personal glory. No, not there. His glory will surpass anything that we could ever attain to hope for. And we will love him all the more. In that place, there will be no more tears. There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more sorrow. I long for the day. As the apostle said, I long for the day when I can take this tent and lay it down that I might go and be with Jesus, that I might go and be with my Savior, that I might go and be in the presence of my Heavenly Father. But the Apostle Paul said, no, I must stay for their sakes. Have you ever been to the place when you know you're such a poured out offering that Everything you are, you're giving to everyone else. You're not saving nothing for yourself. You're just giving yourself away, giving yourself away, giving yourself away. You just give yourself and give yourself away. But you come to the place that you don't expect for the people to give back to you. You're not doing it for the reward of man. You're not doing it for the reward of man because you've learned to die to yourself and live only for God. And because you live for God, the love of God is in you. And it is only through that that you can love the others. 